it is not at all obvious that there is an alternative to the universe existing. What does it even mean for nothing to exist? How does nothingness even exist? The reason why the universe exists is the kind of thing that has an answer to a why question. Maybe we just have to accept it as a brute fact and be lucky about it. If there were no quantum physics, in principle, you could talk about space as having no particles or none of these virtual particles that quantum physics forces into it. That's as pretty good a nothing as anyone would hope to describe, isn't it? No, it's something, it's space. Look, you're absolutely right that there is no pre-existing definition of the word nothing to which we're referring here. You can have different ideas. I think at the deepest level of this question is why is there a universe at all versus complete non-existence, not even space? There's something called the cosmological principle that says that if you squint and look at the universe on very large scales, everything looks the same everywhere, right? The same number of galaxies and whatever. It's a dopey thing to call a principle because it's not a principle. It's just a fact that you see about the universe. It could easily have been otherwise. The early universe, it was even smoother than it is now. It was very, very smooth. How did it evolve from that condition 100,000 years after the Big Bang to our conditions now? It was gravity doing the work. Gravity turns up the contrast knob on the universe. So if you have a slightly emptier region, it empties out. You have a slightly heavier region. It collects matter onto it. And so we went from very faint ripples, if you look at the cosmic background radiation, to these very vivid voids and galaxy clusters that we see today. What the world is, is not a bunch of separate particles doing their own thing. People like me, who are advocates of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, we have a very simple, straightforward way of, of talking about entanglement. When we teach undergraduates quantum mechanics, we say that a quantum system has two different ways of evolving. There's one way it can evolve when you're not looking at it. And that's what Schrodinger and Heisenberg and their friends figured out back in the day. But then there's a whole nother way that we need to describe that behavior when we make a measurement, when we observe the system. Famously in quantum mechanics, you can't predict deterministically, precisely with 100% confidence what answer you're gonna get. You can predict a probability distribution over different possible answers. And Einstein said, God does not play dice with the universe, but it kind of looks like you are playing dice, I'm just saying. You don't expect measurements, observations, looking at things to be part of the fundamental nature of reality, right? It, you know, it never was before quantum mechanics came along. So you can ask yourself, what if like all of that was unnecessary? This whole idea that we need a separate rule for what happens when we measure something. What if you just erase that from the rules of quantum mechanics? And the answer is that what you find is that every possible measurement outcome comes true, but in a different world, in a different part of the overall quantum universe, you get parallel worlds where different measurement outcomes are true. And that's, that's the when I asked what the guy was smoking. Okay, wow. that's <laughs> You can download an app called Universe Splitter. And if you're ever stuck on what decision to make, ask the universe splitter and it will come back with an answer. And you can be guaranteed that there's a whole nother universe which you can never interact with or talk to in which you do the opposite thing. And that's because of the entanglement, because they, they, they couldn't exist simultaneously. They have to exist in those positions at the time of the decision so that when one does it, the other does the opposite, or when one does something, there's an action and there's a reaction, but there can't be action, action. It, it has to be uh, so that they, they're existing and then reacting differently. Is that, is that? Sean, Chuck is about to blow a gasket. And no, because you're freaking me out, man. You are freaking me out. <laughs> Why is the past different from the future? Why is there an arrow of time? The answer is entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. The universe used to be more organized, lower in entropy. The whole history of the universe is just entropy increasing, disorder and chaos developing. And that started about 14 billion years ago near the Big Bang. So our universe was exquisitely orderly. Doesn't necessarily look that way, but you run through the numbers and it's true. Why? We proposed that the Big Bang was not the beginning of our universe. The universe can be eternal, it can last forever, 
But what happens is it empties out, but it still won't be perfectly quiet. There are still quantum fluctuations that can lead to whole new universes coming into existence. And as that happens, they all start in low entropy conditions and the entropy uh, grows and gives that little part of the universe an arrow of time. The far, far past, the same thing happens, but in the other direction. So there's sort of a symmetric shape to the universe where the future is a story of more and more universes being created and the arrow of time pointing in that direction. The past is a story of more and more universes being created with people in them who think that we are in their past. I am not going to lie. You lost me at the end. So, Sean, what you're saying is there's some symmetric point among these universes and these time continua. We're in one direction where entropy increases. But in principle, there's a whole other realm where entropy decreases. From our point of view, from the people living in it, they will always see entropy increasing because we always define the past as the direction in which entropy was lower. That's insane. These are ideas. Is there any way to experimentally verify any of this? Well, we're trying, but the short answer is we don't know yet. There are plenty of tentative preliminary scientific ideas which are too ill for yet. We'll get there. We will get there. Send money. We'll, we'll do it. Just trust us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I think is the best argument for the existence of God. I also think it's a terrible argument, but still it's the best of the ones that they have. You look around the world, the world in which we live, the universe that we find ourselves in, and you say there are features of this universe that need to be the way they are in order for life to exist. If they were different, life couldn't exist. But it, they easily could have been different. We seem to have gotten lucky. We seem to find ourselves in a universe that allows for our existence. And so the argument is, I know why. It's because God did it, because God created a universe in which that's possible. A very common counter argument is, well, it also could just be a multiverse, right? There could be many different parts of the universe and we just are finding ourselves in the hospitable one. God is not beholden to the local laws of physics. God can create life however God wants to, because he's God, unless God does not exist. <laughs> but look, for the last 500 years, as science has done more and more to explain why the universe is the way it is, the role for God as an explanatory move has gone away, has diminished, right? If you want to believe in God, and there's plenty of very, very smart people who do, they they tend not to rely on God to account for the things that we observe in the natural world, what is called natural theology as opposed to natural philosophy. Newton, Galileo, those folks would have called themselves philosophers. The idea of a physicist hadn't been invented yet. Academia loves to categorize and silo people. What that does is that it means that the, all the in-between stuff, because it's really a continuum here, not a... The interstitial ideas and things. Yeah, those just get lost. So you are there to clean up the pieces is what you're saying. Well, I'm actually there to understand the universe. I think that the common thing uh, within natural philosophy is we're not studying the process of science or anything like that. We're studying nature, we're studying reality, but there's a way of doing it that is kind of foundational, that you know takes a step back. What does the present even mean if everything we do to interact with the world has some kind of time delay. Our brain does not perceive the present. Our brain puts together a picture of the world that is on a slight time delay. Like our brain wants to be able to bleep out things that it doesn't like. If you watch someone dribble a basketball and they're right next to you, you will see the basketball hit the ground and you will hear the thump of the basketball against the ground and they coincide, they go along with each other. If they keep walking away, suddenly they will go out of sync the vision of the basketball hitting the ground and the sound of it because that happened suddenly so your brain happens. was correcting for it holy yes, shit because your brain corrects for it as long as it's near enough your brain says this is all now so the brain constructs a present so that we can help make sense of the world in our own moment yeah. that we make decisions the universe is telling us what it does it's just up to us to figure it out isn't that a bias maybe the universe 
is fractured in this way with multiple forces that can't talk to one another. Yeah, that's completely fine. I, I, I did not say it was just going to be one equation. I was just about to say it might be a terrible mess. We don't have any right to say that the final theory of the whole universe will be simple or elegant or easily understandable by us, but we can shoot for it, we can try, and we can give it our best shot and see what happens. That's what we're trying to do. 